Well, welcome everyone to the last talk this semester in the Western Hemisphere Virtual Symplectic Seminar. Uh, we will be starting up again in the fall on September 2nd. Uh, today, we're very happy to have Yanov Ganor talking about big fiber theorems and ideal valued measures in symplectic topology. Hi, so first of all, I would like to thank uh, the organizing team for the excellent opportunity to present in front of you today. So I will tell you about uh, a joint project uh, together with uh, Adit Dickstein, Leonid Polterovich, and Frol Zapolsky. And indeed, as the title says, uh, our topic is Big Fiber Theorems and Ideal Value Measures in Subjective Topology. So let's start with like, what is this, is this all about? So in various fields of mathematics, uh, you, you, you encounter big fiber theorems, which are theorems of the following template that for any map in a suitable class of maps, uh, there has to be some fiber, which is considered big, where of course the notion of size, it depends on the context and the, the example itself. So three examples, which I would like to discuss today are uh, Karasov's uh, topological center point theorem, which has a sort of a, a combinatorial flavor, combinatorial and topological flavor. There is the maximal fiber theorem for maps of the torus by due to Gromov, which is very uh, algebraic topological, and the non-displaceable fiber theorem in symplectic topology due to Antov and Polterovich, which is simplex. And the goal is to use an idea due to Gromov, which is called the ideal valued measure. And this idea uh, actually can be used in the proof of the first uh, two theorems. And that's a good for the model. The third one is you know, originally was proven uh, using a completely orthogonal method. It was proven using what's called the quasi states, which looks very different from those ideal valued measures. And the idea is to combine it with the Varol Gunesh uh, uh, relative symplectic homology. And in this framework, we can put all three theorems on equal footing. Moreover, we can uh, deduce actually a symplectic analogs of the first uh, two theorems, or would I say their, uh, their proofs. So by the way, is my mouse pointer uh, visible in this uh, show window? Yes, it is. Oh, great, so I can point it. That's it. So let's start with uh, the topological center point here. So what does it state? It says that if Y is a metric space of covering dimension D, and covering dimension is uh, some sort of a topological uh, dimension uh, measure that it basically says that uh, any open covering can be refined such that after refinement, every set meets at most D plus one sets. So you can think, for example, of S1, and indeed every covering can be refined to intervals such that each interval, each interval meets only its uh, two neighbors. And so we can see that this is a way to capture the one dimensionality of S1 in this example. And P is just some positive integer. And let us fix N, which is the product of P and D plus one, and denote by delta, delta N, the N simplex. Then the theorem states that for any continuous map from the simplex to such a space Y of dimension D, there exists a fiber that intersects all the PD dimensional faces of the simplex. So for a fine map, it goes all the way back to Rado, but in this uh, formulation with continuous maps, this is due to Karasov in uh, 2014. And just an example of what kind of statement this theorem says, so let us set the parameters to their smallest possible value. So we have the two simplex here, and I just drew some projection to a one dimensional line. And indeed, there is a point such that the fiber over which is that uh, a red uh, uh, segment? And indeed, it meets all three PD dimensional faces of the uh, simplex, which are the one dimensional faces. So, this is our big fiber in this uh, example. Now, second is Gromov's torus theorem. So, the setting is somewhat similar. Again, Y is a metric space of dimension D, and P is a positive integer. But this time we fix n to be at least p times the d plus one. And the theorem says that every continuous map from the torus or the n-dimensional torus to a, a metric space of dimension d must have a big fiber. But now the notion of size is that the rank 
of the restriction map in cohomology is big, namely at least a two to the fifth uh, power. And this is stated with a check cohomology for uh, technical reasons, which will be uh, apparent later. So just an example of what a statement looks like in the simplest case. So we have the two tours and we project uh, to the component to this factor, the factor that goes uh, this way. So the fiber over a point is this uh, uh, red uh, circle. So let, let's call the uh, left-right direction X and the one that goes into the screen uh, Y. So the image of the restriction map in cohomology is actually generated by the unit and by uh, the class dy. So indeed the rank is two, which is two to the power of one. In this case, we said two to one. So this is the kind of a, a phenomena that the theorem guarantees that exists. So the fiber is first of all, complicated enough topologically by itself, but moreover, it sits inside the, the torus in a way that this its topology is being captured by this uh, restriction. So it's also embedded in a sophisticated way. You know? And last but not least is the uh, big fiber theorem, the non-displaceable fiber theorem due to Antov and Polterovich. And it states the following, it looks very different from the previous two. So given a closed symplectic manifold of dimension 2n, uh, consider a map to Rn, R capital N, there is no relation between capital N and uh, lowercase n here. And such that every pair of its components have zero Poisson bracket. Namely, we say that they are Poisson commuting. Then there exists a fiber which is non-displaceable. So in this setting, the notion of size is being non-displaceable. And as we, we know, we kind of, at least from some points of view in symplectic topology, we are uh, consider displaceable sets as being small. And the example uh, is, for example, in S2, just consider some projection to the line. And indeed, the theorem actually guarantees the non-displaceability of the equator. Actually, one could even prove the non-displaceability of the equator using the theorem, since we can demonstrate a displacement for any other fiber. So if we it can demonstrate displacement for all fibers except one, then the, what's left must be non-displaceable due to the theorem. Of course, it's uh, very redundant to do this uh, for the sphere, but same reasoning actually have been applied in uh, more complicated uh, higher dimensional manifolds to produce uh, displaceable, non-displaceable sets. Okay, so let me say something about the proof of the first two theorems. And later we will discuss how we adapt that uh, technology to the symplectic setting. So, so far, any questions about the formulations of the theorem? Great. So ideal valued matrix. What are they? So given a graded skew commutative associative, uni associative unital algebra, but forget all the abstract names, just think of the a cohomology algebra of some compact Hausdorff topological space. And again, check cohomology for technical reasons, which will be uh, apparent in a minute. Um, assuming uh, that we have a finite dimensional algebra, uh, an ideal valued measure is, which is an, a notion due to Gromov, is an assignment that assigns to every open set in X some graded ideal in the algebra, such that a list of axioms uh, which are kind of measure-like axioms are satisfied. And the main example to keep in mind is that the measure of, an, of a set is the kernel of the restriction to its complement. So we kind of want to uh, capture which uh, classes were supported on that set in the sense that those classes vanish when uh, we restrict to the complement. So of course we have this normalization, the measure of the empty set is zero because its complement is the whole thing. And we when we restrict from X to itself, the kernel is zero. And dually the measure of the whole thing is the whole algebra because when we restrict to the, open, to the empty set, the kernel is everything. We have monotonicity just due to the way restrictions behave in a, um, cohomology. Uh, there is a continuity axiom. If, if a set U is an ascending union of uh, open sets, UI, 
then its measure is the union of measures. So it's a sort of a continuity uh, uh, property. And actually for this to hold, uh, uh, we have to work with a check homology because check is a continuous with respect to limits. And for example, a singular cohomology is not. Then there is this additivity axiom, which says that for these joint sets, the measure of their unions is the sum of the measures. So remember the measures are ideals and we can take their sum. And this is some manifestation of the meyer vietoris property. Uh, just it comes basically from the naturality of the meyer vietoris sequence uh, together with the fact that if they are disjoint, one term vanishes. Uh, we have multiplicativity. The product of the measures of u and u prime is a subset of their measure of their intersection. So we have some relation between the product and the intersection. And the way to think about uh, this relation is if just pick, pick the Durham uh, perspective for a second. So if I have a form which is supported on U and another form which is supported on U prime, then I expect their uh, uh, wedge to be supported on the intersection. And actually same reasoning applies uh, even more generally with being exact when restricted to uh, the property, pro appropriate uh, subset. But this is the kind of uh, phenomenon that this multiplicativity uh, uh, captures. And last but, uh, is the intersection property, which says that if a pair of sets cover X, then the measure of their intersection is the intersection of their measures. So in a way, this is somewhat dual to the additivity axiom. So here it's for disjoint sets and here it's for sets which cover X. And note that the correct generalization to more sets of this intersection axiom is that if I have a collection of sets such that pairwise every two open sets cover X, then the measure of the entire collection is the intersection of the measure. So these are our axioms of uh, ideal valid measure. This is due to Bromo. And examples can be given, well, there is what we've already seen. This is the check homology IVM, which just comes from restriction to the complement in cohomology. And we can also have a, a, a push forward construction. So given a continuous map from some X to Y, and given an IVM on X, I can push it forward to obtain an IVM on Y just the, evaluate the measure of every open subs, open set in Y to be the measure of its pre-image. And via this construction, I can obtain on Y an IVM, which has nothing to do with the cohomology of Y. Now, uh, we can actually discuss IVMs in the context of uh, open sets or in the context of uh, compact sets or closed sets. And these two viewpoints will be uh, uh, useful. And in order to not uh, complicate the slides too much, uh, I'm going to use those two viewpoints interchangeably. So I'll just say that one, for example, can uh, approximate every compact set from outside uh, as intersection of uh, opens. And this way kind of translate discussion from open sets to compact sets. Now, how does one prove Karasov's theorem. So Karasov's theorem actually followed from an abstract uh, theorem about uh, IVMs on uh, metric spaces of dimension D. So this is the abstract center point theorem. And the, the formulation and proof I'm going to present is a variation on Karasov's original argument. So he didn't use this language of IVMs. And the theorem says that if I have a compact metric space of dimension D, and I have some algebra and assume that there exists some ideal I in this algebra such that the D plus one power of this ideal is non-zero. And given, take, assume that Y is some IVM on Y with respect to this algebra, then the claim is that the intersection of the collection of all compact sets whose measures contain this ideal is non-empty. Namely, if I have such an ideal, in my algebra, then this ideal allows me to define some notion of scale of sets where I can think that a set is very large if its measure contains this ideal. And the theorem actually says that those sets are actually so large that their entire collection must share a common point. 
So pictorially, just think of this as follows. I have my set Z alpha, and for every set Z, I assign some ideal in the algebra A, which I've drawn here as a plane. And all those planes contain this ideal I. And indeed, if the ideal I uh, satisfies this algebraic condition, then the theorem guarantees the existence of the green point. And let me uh, sketch you the proof because I think it's very instructive to see how all those properties of IVMs kind of play together nicely. So the proof is by contradiction. Assume that this intersection is empty. Then the collection of complements of those compact sets is an open cover of Y. Now, this is a property of uh, covering dimensions, which is called the Palais lemma. It says that every covering can has a refinement such that the refinement can be colored in D plus one colors, such that every color is a disjoint union of sets. So they, by the Palais lemma, I can refine this cover to a, co to a cover which is denoted by Vij, you can think of I as the color index, such that for every I, all the Vij's with I are pairwise disjoint. And put Ki to be the intersection of all the complements to the sets of the same color. Then, due to the multiplicativity uh, property, we have that the product of measures of those Ki's should lie in the measure of their intersection. Now, their intersection is actually intersecting all the complements of the sets that form a cover. So, since any point is covered by one of the um, sets, then the intersection of all the complements is empty. So we, we get due to the multiplicativity and due to this uh, fact checking that the product of measures is zero. So it's enough to show that each of those Ki's contains the ideal I. So if we did we show this, then we will get our desired contradiction since we will have that the I to the D plus one power on the one hand is non-zero from the, uh, what's given. On the other hand, it, it con should be contained in this uh, product, which is zero. And the, the fact that those um, sets Ki contain uh, the ideal I, it follows from the monotonicity property. So we refined uh, the complements of uh, compact sets which contain the I in their, uh, um, in their uh, measure and from the intersection property. And for this part, we are using uh, uh, the fact that uh, those sets are pairwise disjoint, hence their complements uh, pairwise cover the measure. So this is how we get into the contradiction using all those axioms of uh, IVMs. Now, this uh, theorem talks about some point, but I've promised something about fibers, so how we, uh, uh, translate this discussion to fibers. Well, uh, we use the push forward construction. So, corollary is that given a d dimensional space with an ideal as before, and any compact house door space X with an IVM on X, then for any continuous map from X to Y, we have a fiber which intersects every compact set in X with I in its measure. And the idea is just apply this abstract center point to the push forward measure. And from there is just a set theoretic verification that indeed we have a desired uh, intersection. So how does these two, two things combine uh, to uh, prove a uh, Carasol's theorem? Well, so let me recall uh, the formulation again. So I'm looking at the n simplex where n is p times d plus one, where d is the dimension of y, and I'm given a map continuous map from the simplex to Y. And I have to find a fiber which intersects all the BD dimensional faces. So I have to find some algebra and some IVM mu on the simplex such that two properties hold. First, we need the algebra to support such an ideal whose D plus one power is non-zero. And second, uh, we have to uh, find the measure such that uh, I would be contained in the measure of every PD dimensional face. And 
the way to find such a, uh, an algebra and a measure is to consider the moment map from CPN to the simplex. So the pre-image of every, uh, every face, of the simplex is a complex projective hyperspace of the same complex dimension as the dimension of the face in the simplex. So now we take mu to be the push forward IVM where of the cohomological IVM on CPN. So I take the check homology IVM on CPN, I call it new, and I push it forward using the moment map. And from here, it's just a verification that if we take I to be the ideal generated by the Poincaré duals of, uh, of the PD dimensional hypersurface, then if you just kind of unwind definition, you will see that every face has this ideal in its measure because uh, the measure has to do with the kernel of restriction to the complement. So up, upstairs in CPN, if I remove the copy of this uh, projective hyper uh, um, plane, I kill its Poincaré dual class. And the d plus one power is non-zero just by uh, the duality between uh, um, intersection and uh, a cup product. Uh, so that's it. This is how uh, we get the theorem from the abstract theorem. So before I proceed, any questions on that? Cool. Great. So about Gromov's, Gromov's torus theorem, so the structure of the proof is quite similar. So where there are two ingredients. Well, first, one proves some sort of an abstract center point theorem. In IVM and stuff, uh, which is of the form there exists a point where the co dimension of the measure of its complement is at least some uh, expression. Uh, this is some bound given in, by Gromov in, in some algebraic terms in the algebra. And the second component is push forward IVM. And if you recall that the Gromov uh, theorem was uh, about a rank of restriction map. In cohomology to the fiber. So we did here Wait, the IBM. Yeah, sure. Of course. This proof that you gave was it the original proof? So it's a, a digestion of uh, Karasov's original proof into this uh, um, language of uh, IBM. So in his proof, he just works with uh, um, with cohomology classes and properties like if uh, but, but he supports. Used, but did he already use this? Um... Moment map, or was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He used this moment map. Okay. Yeah, this you. is his idea. Thank you. So, in Gromov's uh, uh, theorem, so we have co-dimension of the measure of the complement of, of, of the point. So, uh, the IVM has to do with restriction to the complement. So, measure of the complement of the point has to do with restriction to the fiber. And co-dimension actually measures, uh, instead of measuring the dimension of the kernel, we measure the co-dimension, so we get something, some data about the rank. So this is why such a bound tells us uh, something about Gromov's uh, original theorem. And we will get back to that in a different language a little bit later. So how do we adapt all that uh, story to symplectic topology? Well, for that, we define what we call the ideal valid quasi-measures where we actually weaken one of the, uh, one of the axioms of I IVMs, but we add some new axioms. Now that we have weakened, one, weakened ones, we, can, we have the freedom to add some more. And the goals are basically to adapt this IVM story to the symplectic setting and be able to apply those center point theorems, which are due to Karasov and uh, Gromov, and get some analogous uh, symplectic uh, uh, theorems to those theorems. And moreover, we further explore the notion of symplectic rigidity via this uh, ideal valued lens. So to define uh, IVMs, I have to talk a little bit about uh, Poisson commuting uh, subsets and involutive maps. So given a map from a symplectic manifold to RK, we say that it's involutive if every pair of its component is Poisson commuting. And more generally, we can say that a smooth map from symplectic manifold M to some manifold B is involutive if it pulls back pairs of functions from B to a Poisson commuting function. So this is a certain way of generalization of the first uh, definition. 
but actually one can always embed B into some Rn and use the first definition. So the way I think about involutive maps into a, a manifold is basically maps that locally can be given by a, a collection of uh, Poisson uh, commuting uh, functions. And we say that two compact sets commute if there exist a Poisson commuting functions f and g such that the first set k is the zero set of f and the second set k prime is the zero set of g. So each of them can be given as the zero set uh, of a pair of Poisson commuting functions. And we will say that open sets commute if they're complement. So just an example. So first look on the right. So in dimension two, if the boundaries of uh, two uh, sets intersect, then they do not commute. And indeed, you can think of some kind of uh, radial functions uh, vanishing on those disks. And you can see that the symplectic gradient will be tangent to the boundary circles for each of those sets and the disks. And uh, the, therefore, they will span some uh, non-trivial parallelogram and uh, their uh, symplectic area would be non-zero, so they do, do not commute. And on the other hand, if the boundaries do not intersect, this is general phenomenon, the sets commute. So in this picture, I have drawn two sets, one in this uh, blue color, which goes uh, two thirds down the sphere, and one in this red color, which goes two thirds all the way up the sphere. So these are two disks. And their boundaries are here and here, and they do not intersect. And indeed, uh, if you, can, if you think of F and G, where F, say, van vanishes only on the blue thing and G vanishes only on the red thing, since the boundaries do not intersect, at every point, one of the functions is constant. And since Poisson uh, brackets have to do with the uh, derivatives, we have the, the derivative of each of the functions at every point. At every point, one of the functions has zero derivative. So the Poisson bracket is actually zero everywhere. So these sets uh, uh, commute. And so what are ideal valued quasi measures? So basically they are the same thing as ideal valued measures, only that we weaken the multiplicativity axiom. We now demand multiplicativity only for pairs of subsets which are commuting in our sense. So, and to adapt this notion to the symplectic settings and gain some uh, new strength, once we have weakened this assumption, we actually require two extra axioms. We require symplectic invariance, which is something we did not require for an IVM. So we require invariance under a symplectic isotopy, and we require a vanishing axiom. That is, we want that uh, if a, a compact set K is Hamiltonian, Hamiltonianly displaceable, then it should be contained inside some open set of a zero measure. And moreover, its complement will have a full measure. So basically we want our IV QMs to respect the idea that the displaceable sets are small, are negligible. And our main theorem is that every closed symplectic manifold has an IV QM on it for some algebra. So secretly this algebra is going to be uh, uh, the quantum cohomology algebra of the manifold. And what's the upshot of, of this theorem? So pre-images of sets under involutive maps commute basically due to the definition of involutive maps. So if I apply the same push forward construction to IV QMs, I get an IVM. So now if I have an involutive map and I have an IV QM on my synthetic manifold, I can push it forward and get an IVM on the base of the involutive uh, map. And from there, I can use uh, those center points theorem discussed as before and get some uh, uh, new uh, results which were not known before. So I get symplectic analogs to Karasov's theorem and to Gromov theorem. So before we get to this, just let me give you a, a, a first example of an IVQM. So let us discuss the two sphere. So in dimension two, the two sphere of area one. And I want to define an IVQM. So first of all, it's enough to define it on two-dimensional closed connected submanifolds with boundary. And why is that? It's because I can use the procedures of, uh, of approximation of open sets from inside by those uh, submanifolds to extend the definition via continuity to everything. 
and I can use the um, some sort of uh, additivity uh, idea to uh, deal with the disconnected thing. So my definition is as follows: for a connected submanifold boundary, I say that it either has zero measure or full measure, depending on whether it's displaceable. So if it's contained in a smooth closed disk of area less than half, it has zero measure, and otherwise it has the full measure. So for example, any, uh, any disk of area less than half will have zero measure, but every uh, neighborhood of the equator will have full measure. And one can either verify by hand that this satisfies the axiom of an um, IVQM, or for the specific case of um, when the algebra is uh, the quantum cohomology of a sphere, then one can use our theorem and just compute uh, our construction and to see if it coincides with this con construction in the region. So how do we define our uh, IVQMs in general? So we use the relative simplectic cohomology uh, due to uh, Umut Varulgunesh. And so simplectic cohomology has a very long history. So it basically goes back all the way to Floer, Hofer, Wisotsky, and also later contributions by Tsilibak, Viterbo, Treino, Bourgeois, and Roncha. And the latest version that I know of, and it's quite a useful version, is due to Varul Gunesh. And what he constructs, he constructs the follows. So we get a cohomology for every compact set in M. Also, it is also a ring. I have a product. It's actually a unital. Uh, we have a restriction maps for if k prime is a subset of k, we get restriction. And it satisfies Mayer Vietoris for commuting pair of sets. Moreover, it vanishes for displaceable sets. And we are going to use his uh, cohomology uh, theory uh, for our construction. So we want to set for a open set U uh, that it's ideal value quasi measure, it's IVQM, which I do not tell, will be the kernel of the restriction map in uh, this uh, symplectic uh, cohomology, restriction to the complement. Now, this, uh, uh, in for, um, a second. <clears throat> so a few remarks. So as I said before, we can either discuss those IVMs and IVQMs either on compact sets or open sets just by <coughs> approximation procedures. Second, to achieve the continuity axiom, one actually has to alter this definition a bit. One actually has to uh, introduce some procedure of approximation of uh, open sets from closed sets by, of open sets by compact sets from within and of compact sets by open sets from outside. Um, and so this is actually not a true definition, but it's uh, useful enough to keep in mind uh, for the um, rest of the talk. And lastly, is that while most of the axioms follow uh, usually an analogous proofs uh, to the ones of, of uh, the IVMs, to prove quasi-multiplicativity is actually uh, non-trivial. And this is the part that requires a new idea. So the bulk of our paper is actually dedicated to this uh, quasi-multiplicativity axiom. And at the end of the talk, I will say a few words about it. So, let us now revisit the big fiber theorems now that we have our new tool, the IVM. So first, we find out that uh, Polterovich and Antov's non-displaceable fiber theorem is actually a symplectic analog to Gromov's torus theorem in the following sense. We can use Gromov's center point theorem and the same scheme of proof uh, using the center point theorem and the push forward uh, construction to get the following theorem. Every involutive map from a symplectic manifold M to some manifold B has a fiber where the co-dimension of the IVQM of the complement of the fiber is at least one. So note that displaceability of the fiber would have implied that the co-dimension is zero since due to the vanishing axiom, we would have that its complement has full measure, therefore it's of co-dimension zero. So in particular, we get that this fiber is not displaceable as in the Entov and Polterovic uh, um, theorem. Moreover, Gromov actually gives some lower bounds for this co-dimension here uh, in terms of some invariants constructed uh, from the algebra, which I will not go into 
in, in this talk. So in a way, we got some sort of a quantitative version of the uh, non-displaceable fiber, non -displaceable fiber theorem where we demonstrate some invariant to the core dimension of the measure of the complement to the fiber, where first of all, it's a non-vanishing implies non displaceability but moreover, one can actually now measure its uh, dimension. Okay, that's about the non-displaceable fiber theorem and Gromov theorem. So what is the symplectic analog of uh, Karasov's theorem? So, let us say, recall the setting. So consider I some graded ideal in the quantum cohomology that satisfies that it's d plus one power is non-zero, and B is some space of some manifold of covering dimension D. Then we get, analogously to what we have seen in Carl theorem, that every involutive map from M to B must have a fiber which intersects a huge collection of sets which are all the sets in M such that I is in their measure. And this is a source of a new kind of examples of symplectic rigidity that as far as I know, we're, we're not uh, given before. And to show that this kind of statement is non-empty, I really have to show you some example of an involutive map where indeed this setting happens and this collection is non-empty. So consider the six dimensional torus with coordinates pi, qi on each uh, two-dimensional. So I think of the six-dimensional torus as a product of uh, three two-dimensional tori, and each of them comes with coordinates, uh, cyclic coordinates pi, qi, with uh, the omega form given by dp, dq. Then, for every triplet of points a, b, c in the torus, we can consider three families of a quasi-isotropic subtori of the six-dimensional torus. Basically, just by each time we just fix uh, two different uh, coordinates. So the T1, which is a family dependent on parameter A, A is some point on the torus, is basically given by fixing the Q1 and Q2 coordinates to A. Uh, T2 of B is given by fixing the P coordinates to B, et cetera. So this A, B, and C actually is a pair of, of coordinates. And we said that the T, A, B, C to be the union of the three corresponding tori from each of those families. And so our theorem takes the, the following form that every involutive map from the six dimensional torus times S2 to a two dimensional base must have a fiber intersecting all the sets of the form and the sets are of the form uh, TABC times some equator in S2. So first of all, why we need those tori and those restrictions, etc. So this is kind of from technical reasons, we, we can compute uh, the symplectic cohomology and the restriction maps in the case of a quasi-isotropic uh, sub-tori uh, in a spherical manifold such as uh, this. So in the, it actually turns out that the IVQM of each of those tori uh, coincides with the, just with the topological IVM. And we just needed three tori in order to kill uh, uh, in the measure enough, uh, um, enough classes such that the third power of the ideal of those TABCs uh, will, non will not vanish. Now, why I added this S2 factor here? So we needed to, to I wanted to get some genuinely symplectic phenomena and not some uh, topological rigidity. And in S2, the IVM and the IVQM are uh, radically different, for example, uh, the IVM, the topological IVM of a point will not be zero because I have the um, I have volume class that uh, is killed in restriction. But on the other hand, uh, sorry, I have the unit class, which uh, anyway, uh, in topology, uh, the homologies of, of points are not zero. Yeah, but uh, in the symplectic uh, uh, homology, uh, every displaceable uh, uh, set has a zero homology. So these things behave differently on S2. And hence, just plugging everything in and computing what we know about equators, we get uh, this theorem. So we got some new, uh, new sort of uh, rigidity uh, theorem for uh, uh, involutive maps. 
So in this in this test in this uh, setting, the fiber is guaranteed to be big, not in the sense of displaceability or non-displaceability, but rather in the in that it has to intersect all the sets in somewhat very uh, big uh, infinite family. Now, involutivity is really essential here because otherwise, I can just pick the projection, symplectic projection to the uh, S2 component. And then for every point on the sphere, I can just find some equator not containing it. And the fiber over that point will be disjoint actually from anything times that equator. So without the involutivity uh, assumption, uh, the, the, the coral, the, the statement of the theorem just fails. So this is the symplectic analog of Karasov uh, theorem. Now, in the time left, I would like to say a few words about symplectic rigidity via this uh, viewpoint. And maybe if time permits, I will say a few words more detailed about the construction and the proofs. So uh, given a closed symplectic manifold and tau our uh, symplectic homology IVQM, we say that a compact set K is SH heavy if it has non-zero measure. And so, so for example, on the sphere, the equator has full measure. One can check it from the axiom because the, its complement is actually two open disks, which can be exhausted by, uh, each of them can be exhausted by displaceable compacts. And say for a meridian or, or a latitude on the torus, uh, we get actually that the IVQM is just the same as the cohomological IV. This is a computation that one just has to do. So these, these are two examples of SH heavy sets each on its own manifold. And they enjoy some properties. So first of all, they are Hamiltonianly non-displaceable. And second, if I have two sets such that the product of measures is non-zero, so first of all, trivially, both of them are SH heavy because both these two measures should be non-zero. But moreover, one of them, each of them is non-displaceable from the other using symplectic isotopies. So just an example of this uh, phenomena. So this is a topological actual example here. Everything is the same as in the topological IVM. So for these uh, two disjoint uh, um, meridians, uh, you can just com compute and see that the product of measures that would be something like uh, so their measure would contain the volume form and it could contain the form uh, uh, dx and indeed dx wedge dx is zero and the volume form wedge anything is uh, zero so indeed the product here is zero and these things don't even intersect but here one of them will have a dy in its measure and the other one will have dx in its measure and the product is non-zero so you can actually see their intersection here. And of course, there are higher dimensional examples. So a non-trivial symplectic example can actually be given in the product of a torus and a sphere. And in, inside this, we uh, demonstrate two uh, Lagrangian tori. One is the green torus, which is the product of this uh, meridian and this equator. And the other is this cherry color torus, product of this meridian and this torus. And they are both uh, non-displaceable from each other using uh, symplectic isotopies. And this is, uh, this is a computation that we can do using this, our uh, IVQMs. We can compute the IVQM of each of those torus and see that indeed their product of ideal is non-zero. So of course they are smoothly displaceable. I can shrink in the sphere factor one of those uh, equators. And uh, uh, this uh, result is, uh, is uh, not uh, new. It actually appeared in a paper uh, due to, now I have a blackout, I will check in my notes due to whom, and he did it using uh, a quasi, using Lagrangian uh, uh, quasi-states. Uh, but first of all, I think this viewpoint is quite nice. And second, I believe that uh, once we are, uh, um, uh, develop uh, the science of um, computing SH uh, symplectic homology, we could find uh, more examples. And as for the credit of this or result originally, I'm sorry for the blackout, I will check uh, later. 
So I think I will skip the proof of uh, non-displaceability because it's basically uh, just using this uh, quasi-multiplicativity property and um, the axioms of FAVQM. And I will go to some nice discussion about categorification of heaviness. So given n omega a closed syntactic manifold and E an idempotent in the quantum cohomology, uh, the definition due to Antovat Polterovic uh, of something called a partial symplectic quasi state goes as follows. So we take the spectral invariant with respect to E and we homogenize it. Just take the limit of um, K multiple, multiples of F divided by K. And we say that the set is heavy if for every F one has that the quasi state is, at is determined, is bounded uh, by the infimum of F on K. So um, just a few words about it. So if for those who are not familiar with spectral invariant, these are basically uh, some way to select certain action uh, uh, levels, which are homologically significant. And so those partial symplectic quasi states are actually functions, functionals on the space of functions. And it turns out that they behave uh, nicely uh, with respect to uh, Poisson commuting uh, functions in a way. And so properties of heavy sets are quite similar to the properties of the SH heavy sets. So heavy sets are non-displaceable, but heavy sets, as they need not necessarily intersect, same as in SH heavy sets. We've seen two uh, meridian on, on in the other in the other case, they, in one case they intersected, in one case they did not. And from the description of heavy sets, it's unclear how to detect intersections unlike the case of SH heavy sets, where we have this product uh, property, the product of two measures is non-zero, they have to intersect rigidly. So uh, conjecturally, heavy implies SH heavy. And we managed to prove this in a simple case, uh, the simplest case, actually. It's index bounded in compressible domains in a spherical manifold. So, it's the simplest case where basically uh, all the complications vanish and we can just compute things. And in this case, actually the results, they sort of coincide with the uh, um, topological uh, measures. Uh, on the other hand, in the other direction, actually it's in previous versions of these talks, we which tended to believe that the other direction is very speculative and difficult, but actually, uh, Soon uh, proved it for index bounded in compressible in the, in the index bounded in compressible spherical case, and also there is an argument due to Val Gunesh and Mac in the general case. So actually, it turns out that SH heaviness uh, implies heaviness. Apparently, so I believe that those things at some point will be made public. So at this point, it, it's been made by private communication to us. A, so. You know, before I go on to this uh, uh, discussion of a, a construction of IVQMs, uh, are there any questions about the results or discussion that's been so far, something that you would like to ask? Uh, can you remind me what the uh, CKF semicolon E is? Uh, the what, sorry? Ah, yeah. So. Uh, the CK, it's the spectral invariant. So what it does, it's uh, you take the, uh, the Hamiltonian floor cohomology of the Hamiltonian KF, and you check uh, what is the least action level in which you can capture the class E. So you know that the, uh, the Hamiltonian floor homology should be uh, isomorphic to the homology of the manifold. E is some class in this homology. And you basically want to know what is the smallest action level which has a, a, a representative uh, for this uh, class. So I don't know if you are familiar with the flower theory, but if you yeah. you can think. Thank you. And yeah. Okay. And um, as for, uh, the, as I promised before, as for the credit for this uh, non-displaceability uh, of uh, one torus from another here, 
using a Lagrangian spectral, a Lagrangian quasi-states. Uh, this is due to a Kawasaki. Okay. So I got lost. Uh, so, sorry, I just have something floating on my screen. And, okay, great. So where were we? So a little more details about the construction of our IVQM. This is going to be a little bit technical, so I apologize for those who are less familiar with this. So let me briefly uh, uh, describe uh, von Gunesh uh, a relative symplectic cohomology. So uh, the coefficients are going to be the Novikov ring or the Novikov field, depending on the context. So these are basically just formal sums in the T parameter with coefficients, say, in Q, where the power uh, go to infinity, are real numbers that tend to infinity. And the Novikov ring is the subring of that field where the powers are uh, non-negative. So this is a field and this is actually it's a fraction. In, this is a ring and this is its fraction field. Now, given a Hamiltonian, consider the set of its one periodic orbits, which can be graded by the Condit center index mode two. And one can define the Floer complex to be uh, generated over the Novikov ring, uh, just freely generated over the Novikov ring uh, by those one periodic orbits. Note that in this version of the floor cohomology, we have no cappings. The floor differential is basically given by the positive gradient flow of the action functional. It's, it's a cohomology. So it, of course, as usual, uh, uh, translates to counting some uh, uh, floor solutions. But the count is weighted by the topological energy of the floor solutions. So we kind of separate our sum according to the uh, homotopy classes of the cylinders between gamma minus and gamma plus, and we weigh uh, each class by its uh, topological energy. Now, if we had cappings, or for example, if we um, say we are in the aspherical case where we don't need the, the choice of capping to, to define action, then this expression actually corresponds to the action difference within the generator. So you can think of it as in a way as weighted by the action difference. Now we have continuation maps between different Hamiltonians defined using the parametric uh, floor equation. And again, they are weighted by the topological energy of action difference. And for it to be defined over the Novikov uh, ring, we need to go from a lower Hamiltonian to a higher Hamiltonian because we have to increase action. And the relative symplectic cohomology for a given set K is defined using the following construction. So one selects a, a sequence of Hamiltonians such, they, such that they converge to infinity on the complement of K and they converge to zero on K and they are negative on K. Such the data can be called, it is called acceleration data. And one defined the symplectic cohomological complex as the t adic completion uh, of the direct limit of this uh, um, sequence of Hamiltonian. Now, t adic completion can be can be either done kind of algebraically as an inverse limits of uh, truncations, where each time we truncate to the quotient of the quotient ring, uh, where we quotient uh, high enough powers, or uh, you can think of it metrically, just that we have some kind of t adic norm where higher t powers are considered small, and we just do some metric completion uh, with respect uh, to that um, um, metric. And what is it good for? Well, the idea is to algebraically eliminate the contributions of orbits which come from the upper part. So. Assume for, for the simplest example, assume that I have some even say more critical points that are just appearing in each uh, level here in the upper orbit part. And assume that they are sent one to another by the continuation maps. So for that factor that generated by that uh, generators, I just get this tower of copies of the Novikov rings and maps between them and recall that the maps are weighted by the action difference. And so assume that say I chose the acceleration data to have some difference say of 
one in the levels between each step. So we get this uh, uh, diagram, this um, diagram where I have the, uh, sorry, the Novikov rings and the maps between each of them is the multiplication by T. And so let me just uh, briefly compute the limit. So basically one can compute the limit by a dual viewpoint, just we can find isomorphism of each of those models uh, to the models given by the power starting from zero, starting from minus one, starting from minus two, et cetera. And now instead of multiplying by T, we're just using uh, embeddings. So this gives us a, an equivalent diagram, the limit of which is just the Novikov uh, field, because in the limit, I can start the powers as low as I want. But uh, note that the Novikov field has uh, no torsion at all. So those tensors here with torsion uh, uh, models just give zero. So in this completion process, everything that escaped to infinity, at least morally, should be eliminated. And the symplectic cohomology is defined over the Novikov ring as a Novikov ring model as the homology of this uh, symplectic complex. And one can eliminate torsion from the symplectic uh, cohomology uh, ring itself by tensoring with the Novikov ring after taking homology. And this comes with the restriction maps due to the existence of uh, compatible uh, continuations. And major re result by von Gunesh is that uh, those, uh, uh, there is a, a Meyer Vietri sequence for uh, commuting subsets. And in, the, in his work with Tonkonov, he actually shows that you can in, uh, in actually uh, imbue those uh, uh, modules with a ring structure, unital ring structure. Now recall our IVQM was defined. So here is the regularized version. So for a compact K, we just intersect all the kernels of restriction to the complements of open sets containing K. And quasi-multiplicativity is non-trivial. And one reason why quasi-multiplicativity is non-trivial is that it's very difficult to work in chain level, in chain level here because nothing uh, commutes on the nodes on the chain level. So for example, uh, composition of restriction maps, if I restrict, restrict from K to K prime and from K prime to K double prime or restrict directly, so while the composition of the maps will be equal to the direct restriction in cohomology, on the chain level, it, it does so only up to homotopy. So our idea was to define a, a cohomology of pairs. And in order to do that, we actually have to use uh, the cocoon construction, which is some algebraic construction in um, chain complexes, but morally you could think of it as homotopy kernel. So this is kind of a replacement of kernel, of, but by something that behaves nice with respect to homotopies. So basically we define our relative product, the homology of pairs to be uh, the homology generated by the homotopy kernel of the restriction. And indeed we get an exact triangle that corresponds to the usual uh, exact uh, sequence that is given with uh, a homology of pairs. We have from the cohomology of the pair to the cohomology of the first one to the cohomology of the second one. And the main ingredient is to lift this product that we have in the symplectic homology. We want to lift it for pairs of sets A and B for A and B commuting. So we lift the product uh, to our uh, extension to a uh, cohomology of pairs in such a way that the product goes from the cohomology relative to A and the cohomology relative to B to the cohomology relative to the union. This is a similar situation as what happens with the a cup product in, a, a, in a, say, singular homology. Now, not, note that from the exactness of this sequence, since, uh, um, as I said, our IVQM is given by the kernel of restriction, this is the same as the image of this map from the cohomology of pairs. And these uh, two components, the lifting of the product 
and the identification of the IVQM as the image of something that comes from a much more functorial uh, uh, object, together they, they give us the quasi-multiplicativity. Now, why do we expect uh, 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 sets to commute uh, for this uh, product uh, lifting to, to take place? So recall that uh, the Meyer Vietori sequence requires the sets AB to be commuting. And in classic algebraic topology, uh, we, say, uh, we say that two sets satisfy Meyer Vietories. We can actually check that they, they, they do that if they form what's called an excisive pair. An excisive pair is basically saying in homology that the natural chain map from the sets of sums of chains on A and B to the chains of the union is an isomorphism in homology. So you can think of commuting as in a certain way, the symplectic analog of this excisive pair property. Similarly, classically, the relative coproduct ex exists for ex excisive pairs. So we need A and B to be excisive pair for this uh, relative coproduct to exist. And analogously, you should expect the uh, in relative product to exist for uh, uh, commuting sets. So this is all I'm going to say about the construction now. Maybe if you want more to talk about it in the discussion, it would be great. And I would like to thank you for the attention. Great, thanks so much for the talk. Let's give you another hand. So are, are there, there any questions? Yes. Oh, I see that there was a question in the chat. Given an ideal of QH, when can, when can you find a set representing it? So, uh, Johan, can you explain the question? I'm not sure I understand. In what sense representing it? So, just the set, uh, the measure of the set being that ideal. Oh, so you are saying which ideals can be realized by by as a measure as the measures of some set? Yes. It's a very good question, and we actually have not thought of it. So I don't know but it's definitely something worth exploring. Then for example, if you know the ideal is uh, let's say maximal prime, then you, do you have some counterpart property about the set? Mm, at, at the point, no, but definitely worth exploring. Yep. So what are your other questions? I had a question about the IVQM versus the IVM. What's yeah, the, sure. can, can you say again um, why one considers this like the, the slightly weaker condition? Like what does that mean, mean exactly? Okay, so uh, let me just go to the IVM. And, First. So in the IVM, we had this multiplicativity for every pair of the open sets. And in the IVQM, we consider this multiplicativity only for a commuting a pairs. So uh, non-commuting pairs actually can uh, are, allow, are, are allowed to not satisfy uh, this axiom. So just to give some context, there is this construction of uh, a Antov and Polterovich of the quasi, of the quasi states, of the partial symplectic quasi states, and in some cases, actually genuine symplectic quasi states. So let me talk about, about symplectic quasi states for a second. So they are sort of functional looking things on the space of functions, but they do not satisfy linearity. They actually, if I remove the word partially in the case where it's a genuine symplectic quasi state, uh, they satisfy linearity only for pairs of functions which are Poisson commuting. Or as you can say, as you say, maybe when restricted to a Poisson commuting a, a subspaces of this uh, Lie algebra. So kind of uh, this, uh, there, is, there, are, there, were, there were some pre previous examples of, of kind of uh, symplectic uh, creatures where some property, some useful property were satisfied only under this Poisson commutation. Now, from the technical viewpoint, this is due to the fact that I need to prove the quasi-multiplicativity. I actually 
is where is that? I need the um, this. I need this lifting of the product. So, so the idea basically is that if some class uh, vanishes when I restrict to A and some other class vanishes when I restrict to B, so I, I, I lift each of them to some class on the relative cohomology of pairs. And then when I compute the product, the product comes from uh, the uh, relative, uh, uh, from the cohomology of a pair relative to the union of sets. And, and one uses this uh, together with uh, the meyer vietoris sequence to actually uh, uh, realize this quasi-multiplicativity uh, property. So basically this allows me to know that their product kind of vanishes on the union. Yeah, this is just basically see what I want to say. So down, down there on the cohomology of M, I don't know how, how to say anything like that, but once I, I pass to those pairs where I have this sort of uh, nice functorial behavior, I know that if some class uh, vanishes when restricted to A, then it lifts to, the, to here, and some other class vanishes when restricted to B, it lifts here. Now I take a product, I know that it lies in this, and the shadow of this are, is exactly the kernel of restriction to A union B. So you can also think of it from the technical point of view that uh, I just, this is the property of the cohomology theory uh, that requires this commut commutation. But in a way, you can see that this cohomology theory satisfies things that the usual cohomology does not. For example, uh, it does not, uh, uh, it vanishes for uh, displaceable sets or it is a uh, symplectic uh, invariant under, under symplectic isotopies. And these are properties which are not satisfied uh, by the usual cohomology theory. So in a way, uh, we can, in a way, with, in a way which is maybe not clear why, but weakening this axiom allowed us to gain two extra properties, which were nice. So I hope this answers the question. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So, so it's allowing you to have like a, a mayor via Taurus. Uh, yeah. Statement. Yeah, Meredith, and also this uh, uh, this uh, uh, statement about product. So ah. I don't know. I mean, if you are more categorically inclined, so what actually goes on is that, for example, for Mayer Vietoris, uh, one needs this excisive pair condition. And this excisive pair basically, you have. Uh, some pullback or push-out diagram involving the complexes of a, of a, the complex of B, and the complex of the union. And so I think in this in homology, this is this, this is just a, you can construct some pullback uh, diagram. And the pullback actually turns out to be uh, this sum. Uh, sorry, in the in, in uh, cohomology you have a push-out diagram. It goes from the intersection to A and to B and you do a push out and you can see that it actually equals this sum. Now, what the excisive fair condition is actually identifying this pullback with something more familiar, which is the complexes on the union. And the existence of the Maya Vietori sequence can actually be reduced to some abstract uh, uh, theorem about pullback squares. So there is some pullback square, it gives some uh, long exact sequence and then you just take those pullback terms and you identify them with the, uh, the chains on the union. And similarly, if one unwinds uh, the proof of uh, Val Gunev uh, for the Meyer Vietori, it basically follows the same procedure where there is some homotopy pullback construction. It is constructed from some chains and sets and the uh, union. And the, the Poisson commutation actually allows one to identify this pullback with the chains or co-chains on, on the corresponding set. And similar thing happens behind the scenes when you are working with those pairs and trying to construct this uh, uh, product. So you need, so the commutation can be thought of some geometric condition, which guarantees this algebraic condition of identifying the pullback uh, or push forward and chains uh, with something on the, union or intersection, depending on your version of homology or homology. That makes sense. Thanks. Cool. Are there other questions? 
I actually had a, had a question, uh, a little bit of a vague question, but um, so what would happen if you if you didn't tensor with the Navikov field and you actually kept things over the Navikov ring? So so then yeah, of course so it's not going to be true that it that it you know you get zero for a displaceable set. But I was wondering if maybe yeah you uh, get some you get some torsion exponents and they actually yeah. can be related to displacement energy. This actually appears in the thesis of Vogelgrunas, not in the paper, but if you look out his uh, dissertation, he talks about that. Now, the reason that we worked over the uh, field and not over the ring was because we wanted to use those center point theorems of algebras, and we needed finite dimensional algebras over a field, just because this is what the structure of those theorems are. But from the point of view of uh, the symplectic rigidity, say exploring the product or non or non or heaviness and things like that, it's actually I think quite interesting to see what it, what happens when you work over uh, um, the Novikov ring. And this is actually something that we are actively looking into. Um, basically, okay. the the main obstacle right now is the lack of examples. So th th those environments are are, are kind of not so easy to compute. So it, it, they require work, but. Uh, right, well, I was wondering like, but I guess. I definitely believe, I def we definitely believe that there is some very important information hidden inside the, the torsion uh, components over the Novikov ring. And uh, definitely one should be able to extract something. But the reason we went, we worked over the, ring, over the field was just because the, our, the whole setting of say Gromov's uh, center point theorem that, that bound on the co-dimension of uh, of the measure of a fiber and things like that. That the, these were done in the setting of uh, an algebra over a field immediately. Mm -hmm. Excellent question. So what is the next question? I guess I had one more question um, about the connection between heavy and, and SH heavy. Well, sorry, I, I, there was a, a disconnection. I, I didn't hear you. What about SH heavy? What's the, the connection between SH heavy and heavy? Oh, the, so, so it turns out that Apparently, SH heavy implies heavy. This is a, there is a general argument by von Gunes and the map, and particular argument by uh, Johan Son in the index bounded incompressible spherical case. A, conjecturally, I, we, I, I would expect them to, to be equivalent, but uh, we have not yet managed to prove that heaviness implies SH heaviness without all those uh, restrictions on our domain. So these are just restrictions which allow for uh, easier uh, computation. So maybe just to get into some technical terms, yeah. So what we would like to show is that if something is heavy, then we, would, we need to find uh, some class uh, that goes to zero in the uh, via the restriction map in this uh, SH uh, chromology. And what we managed to, to show so far is that we have some class that can be represented by uh, things which are multiplied by higher and higher powers of T. But since one does not know that the cohomology is complete with respect to this uh, periodic valuation. This is not enough to show vanishing. So it kind of, it looks like it kind of wants to, to vanish, but unless there are, there are some very uh, um, pathological examples of this case, uh, or maybe a stronger argument. Uh, um, so, so I believe that maybe with a stronger argument, uh, one could really show that heavy implies SHA. And under these uh, conditions, we could m compute much more what's going on there, and we could actually point out a specific class which, which vanishes. But 
Thanks so much for, for, for the great talk and for wrapping us up this semester. Well, let's let's give you another. Thank you for the invitation. Invitation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.